Hey everybody, it's good to see you back again. I'll level with you right off the bat. We're not going to do any actual work in this episode. Rather, I want to use it as an opportunity to answer a couple of very common questions I've been seeing coming up in the comment section lately that I think are worthy of some additional discussion. But as for where I am with the tri-build series, we've been doing a lot of measuring and figuring out and calculations and everything to try and decide how I want to make this new bearing. So we'll go over here to the miniature lathe. I haven't been filming any of the turning process for getting this milled out because while well, I've I've machined aluminum, aluminum, slow down dude, before, kind of, but never really to attain a good surface finish. And with a bearing, especially on the inside, you're going to want to have a really, really good surface finish. You don't want it to be rough or galled or grooved, anything like that. So there's been a lot of trial and error, a lot of behind the scenes research and changing different rake profiles and bit composition and probably the biggest thing is not machining dry so that's probably been the biggest thing that's helped me to get better and better finishes on here so yeah i haven't been showing any of that because i'm really not skilled or experienced enough with aluminum yet to be a person that's telling other people how to do it so i'm gonna get it figured out probably kind of in a behind the scenes manner and then um once it's once i get a little bit better at it I'm gonna to have to make bearings for this other block anyway, right here. So maybe we'll have an opportunity to actually show some of that. But that leads me to the first question that I wanna address. A lot of people have been asking, why aluminum for a bearing choice in this engine? And by now, you should know me well enough to know I have an example of an earlier design that was not aluminum. Yeah, when CAT first started making these opposed twin cylinder starting engines on the D4400, I believe was the first iteration, and then D3400 after that, the original main bearings were like this. It was a bronze backing, heavy bronze backing, just with a thin bonded layer of babbit on there to be the actual bearing surface. So the crankshaft only ever contacted the babbit. Um, these eventually, I should say quickly, fell out of favor because the bearing life was not great on these. They wore out pretty fast. And the Babbitt was a much softer surface for the crank journal to ride on, and it was a lot more forgiving. It would embed particles and everything that wouldn't just score around and around, but it didn't wear on the crank journals quite as fast as the aluminum did, but because you would wear the bearings out so fast and your journals would still be good, you were putting a couple sets of bearings in on the same journal before you had to have that undersized. But, well, we eventually made the switch to aluminum. And I want to reference back to the selected articles from Service Magazine's book. There's always good stuff in here. And it kind of touches on this a little bit. This is mostly about the diesel engines, but there is an aluminum bearings bulletin from November 29th, 1946. And if you will remember, all the bearings on the crankshaft in the diesel engine, both rod and main, they are aluminum as well. So CAT used a lot of aluminum bearings back in the day, but they all started with the Babbitt line. So November of 46, they say, aluminum alloy connecting rod and main bearings are now used in all current Caterpillar diesel engines. These bearings are interchangeable with the precision type Babbitt bearings formerly used and will give much longer bearing life. That was the key right there. So this middle paragraph is not really relevant to what we're talking about, but it also touches on, although fine dirt and abrasives in the oil affects aluminum and Babbitt bearings somewhat alike, coarser particles act quite differently. While the softer Babbitt bearing may permit such large particles to become embedded in the bearing, these same size particles may merely roll around between the bearing and crankshaft journal causing deep scratches in the aluminum bearing without actually becoming embedded in the aluminum. Such scratches are not necessarily harmful and do not indicate that the bearings should be replaced. So that in itself is, well, proof that, yeah, aluminum is harder on the journals of these crankshafts, although it lasted several times longer than the Babbitt line before service had to be performed in here. Typically, by the time the aluminum bearing wore, the crankshaft journal was also worn enough that it had to be undersized. So you didn't get as many rebuilds out of the same crankshaft with aluminum bearings, but you still had to do a few overall rebuilds and service life of both components, I guess you could say, was extended so yeah we're, we're just going to fewer and fewer and fewer rebuild intervals with the aluminum bearing now another question a lot of people have asked can you just put a bronze bearing on there yes you can the problem with bronze is it's still harder than this aluminum and 
these crankshafts are not hardened sufficiently to last as long on the bronze still as they will on the aluminum. So whether you go back to Babbitt to have the bearing wear out sooner or go to bronze to wear the crankshaft out sooner or in my world, I'm just sticking right with the aluminum. I believe it's the perfect middle ground compromise where you get bearing life versus lesser amounts of wear. Another option that's been brought up in the comment section that has been used with success on, I believe it was gravely tractor engines is hardening the crankshafts and then going with a much more robust bronze type bearing. So that's another thing that I'm hesitant to do, um, partly because these are hollow journal crankshafts. So you can see my finger back there, the rod journals both are hollow on these. And that's been a failure point in the past as well, where if these things are gonna crack, it happens on one of those rod journals. So I personally am hesitant to put these through any more adversity than they've already been through. And the biggest thing with aluminum main bearings, now a couple people mentioned how the aluminum obviously doesn't hold up because this galled and spun. Well, the reason why these spin is because they had a poor means of retention to begin with. And well, they gall primarily because of the old problem where the operator's not diligent about always turning the gasoline tap off and fuel runs down in the crankcase and dilutes the oil. When that happens, that's when the galling starts and that's when the real spinning action starts to take place. If you keep up on the maintenance, always have clean oil and to sufficient level and always, always, always make sure gasoline does not get down in the crank cases on these, the aluminum bearings actually performed very, very well. So it doesn't bother me a bit going with aluminum. Oh, and that's another thing. Um, I'm not the first person to make new aluminum bearings for these. I know several other people that have. I know one that even had the uh, the analysis done to an original and it's just like 6061 aluminum, just plain old average aluminum stock is pretty much absolute equivalent to what these originals were. So 6061 is what I'm making the new ones out of as well. So that should pretty much cover the main bearing topic. Now, the second frequently asked question in the comment section that I want to cover in this episode pertains to these pipes and tubes that are in place in the valve compartments on the earlier 4B series blocks, but are conspicuously missing on the later 5F series blocks. And why is that? It seems like a simple question on the surface, but the more you look at these, the more you realize is going on and the more there is to know. So it's actually, I think, really, really interesting to take into account how these things were put together. So there's a lot of plumbing on these earlier 4B series blocks. And the more you look at it, the more it appears to me anyhow, opinion time. Cat was relying on the crankcase pressure pulses that happen when both those pistons come in and increase crankcase pressure, and then they go back out and they decrease crankcase pressure. I believe that was, well, kind of taken advantage of as a rudimentary oil pressure pump that keeps oil circulating and flowing and moving throughout these engines all the time. And, you know, further evidence by the fact that there's no dippers on the connecting rods. So I don't think when these things are running, there's necessarily a consistent oil level down in the sump. I believe most of that stuff is whirling around or suspended the majority of the time. Remember, we're only dealing with about one quart of oil anyway. You spread one quart out around all these compartments. That's not a whole lot of oil in, in any one place at any given time. So what exactly are these tubes used for? Honestly, I don't know. Uh, I've looked at this several different ways and it could go in one of two ways, but let's look at how the tappet bores are lubricated. So we have the early block here that has the tubes. Notice we have a drilling right there and a drilling right there. On the later block, those drillings are not in place and the taps for the tubes are not there either. But you look inside the tappet bores and you can see that dark ring in there and that one as well. That's an internal cavity that actually joins both of those bores. The other one's the same way. And that cavity is also in place. You can see it in there on the later block too. So there's also a difference in tappet design. So here's the tappet from this early block and it's solid. There's no holes in it, all right? But you look at the tappets on the later block that don't have any of the piping, there's three holes and it's actually, there's a small cavity in there as well. So why is that? Obviously between these holes and these pipes, it's to get lubrication into and out of these bores. Like I said before, as those crankcase pressure pulses are pushing and pulling on the oil supply, that's just part of the circulatory system right there. And 
we can get by with a solid tap it in here because I don't know if the hole is the intake or the return or the pipe is the intake or the return. Either way, you have a means for circulating oil through those bores and a solid tap that's gonna live just fine. Personally, I can't back this up with anything, but I believe these tubes are more like a straw. They're a suction device because they go down to the low point of the system. Even though we have these, this is a like a drain hole right here that is hooked to that tube. We have the same, a similar drain hole down in that corner that's hooked to that tube that goes to the crankcase. When this thing is running and the pressures are all wonky, I believe those two low point drains are for after you shut it off. It just helps all the compartments return down to the sump. I believe these are more for when the engine is running, pressures are pulsing like crazy, and this draws from this other low point in each valve cavity and is going to help to put oil up into these tappet bores. And I would bet these are probably the returns where the excess comes out here and it just returns back down to the sump. So with all of that additional drilling and plumbing just not in place on the later blocks, I think Cat realized that there was enough pulsing going on in these crankshafts to pretty much push oil into everything. So they just retained the open cavity between those two bores kind of as an additional reservoir. And we just drilled a few holes into these tappets to actually get oil to actually circulate through and be held, retained in them to a certain extent. And obviously everything lasted just fine because there's way more of these later 5F blocks in service in operation than there ever was these early first gen 4Bs. So I believe that somewhat explains why there's extra plumbing in the early ones that isn't found in the later ones. And just to kind of put the whole puzzle together a little bit more, we'll go back to the Service Articles magazine. Again, I can spend I could spend days just showing you guys stuff out of here. It's, it's just an excellent, excellent source for information. But we go to the starting engine manifold gaskets. You can see a couple of breakdowns right here. That's what we have right here. That's the D2 slash D4 example, new from CAT. So this is actually regarding the inline six cylinder, four and a quarter bore and five and three quarter bore, eight cylinder diesel engines that each had opposed starting engines similar to these, just upscaled, larger in size. And it's from 1940. So these were already out for six years by this point, but they had troubles with, well, we'll just get right to it. Some reports have been received on starting engine connecting rod bearing failures on the four and a quarter bore six cylinder diesel engine and five and three quarter bore eight cylinder diesel engine. It has been discovered that oil from the crankcase of these starting engines may be forced up the drain tubes and fill the valve compartments, causing a low oil level in the crankcase. The connecting rod bearings in the starting engine are then starved of lubrication and bearing failures occur. So that's proof that in the larger iteration of these, these drain tubes here actually worked in reverse where that crankcase pressure actually pushed oil primarily up into those two upper cavities and then everything was starved in there. So there's actually a lot going on inside of these things. So the way they solved that, the gasket under the manifold of these starting engines has been changed recently to provide a vent between each valve compartment and the crankcase. The presence of these vents will equalize the pressure in the crankcase and valve compartments and permit oil in the valve compartments to drain back into the crankcase. The accompanying sketch shows the location of the slots in the manifold gaskets. You can see dimensions and locations, how to cut them where. Whenever servicemen have an opportunity to work on these starting engines, the slots indicated in the sketch should be made in the gaskets. And well, yeah, so it kind of baffles me because I'm of the understanding that those slots have always been in the D2 slash D4 starting engine top cover gaskets. And it seems like these always were vented on that top cover gasket to correct that problem. And they made these before they made these style opposed engines, yet it became a problem on these where I believe they'd already identified it on these. So I don't really understand why we changed that top cover gasket on the later ones, even though the lubrication principles were obviously the same, but it's just an interesting deal that shows how much is actually being forced around inside these when they're running. So maybe this created more questions than it provided answers, but that's my whole take on the mystery of all the extra plumbing that's in the early ones versus the lack thereof in the later ones. So that was about all I want to touch on in this episode. I like that kind of uh, throwing around of ideas and that um, like technical debate discussion that goes on and anybody that has potential better ways of doing things and they, they're um, they feel free to share it in the comment section, bring it up. That's exactly why I make this type of content. Uh, like I've said before, it's not so much 
you know, the end result, just hearing it run, it's the, the how and the why and the maybe ways to make it better or solve problems in the process. That's kind of the main point of the whole 1113 rebuild series. So yeah, and probably in future like D2 series, I won't get so heavy on the technical and procedural aspects because we've covered so many of them pretty much in depth on 1113, but that's kind of the whole, that's been the whole intent of the 1113 rebuild series to this point. So hopefully that makes sense. So again, everybody, great questions, uh, great, you know, exchange, exchange of ideas in the comment section. I'm going to mess it up here. I'm starting to make, <laughs> make mistakes, so I better wrap it up. Um, thanks everybody. I'm going to keep uh, rolling ahead and trying to machine aluminum to satisfactory results here. And um, yeah, I want to get this engine put back together and we can go on to that third one where we're going to try some really wild stuff. So thanks again, everybody. Hope to see you back.